Welcome back, wonderful history nerds. Kat and I just wanted to thank you for your continued listenership, as well as give a warm welcome to all the newcomers. We'd also like to remind everyone to check out our Instagram page at Lit Story Podcast, where I try to remember to post for each episode. Also, please, please, please like, subscribe, rate, and review on whatever podcast platform you might be using. It really helps us to gain new listeners so everyone can learn about the weirder, lesser known sides of history. On that note, Kat, would you like to make an announcement about our new side podcast that you're going to be running? Yeah, so Ashley and I decided to do something a little bit crazy and add another podcast onto our plates. So it's taking a bit of a different direction. Rather than focusing on history, it's going to be focusing on movies. The idea is that Ashley and I individually are going to sit down, watch a movie, write out, write out our notes, write out our thoughts, anything that we notice about plot um, or character or the music or the sound effects, the costuming, whatever it is. Um, and then come together and talk about it. Full spoilers ahead. We will be discussing themes from the movies. We'll be talking about stereotypes and tropes and uh, like anything that you can dive into with a film. Um, and we will be going into what happens at the end and how does it all wrap up and why. So if you're interested in uh, hearing someone else talk about your favorite movie, um, pop over there and definitely send us requests on our Instagram through the DMs there. I think it would be great if we had some uh, ideas from the audience as well so that we know what you guys are interested in um, so we can watch those as well as, you know, movies that we're already interested in. Yeah, and there will be some history points because like with our first episode, I do have some of like the history behind the movies as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially anything that ties into historical context, obviously, we're going to be talking about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. But don't worry, what do you know about isn't going anywhere. I will be continuing to bring you all more stories from history as I have like 30 episodes in the work, in the works between researching and writing about these fascinating events and people. You'll still find a history fix on Mondays to go along with your new Friday film chats. So cozy up, grab a bucket of popcorn, and come hang out with us. Exactly. Um, so yeah, let's get on with the history though, shall we? There is a poetry, love, scandal, and perhaps some death to uncover today. Ooh, sounds dramatic. I will be giving I will give the blanket warning that this episode does include some discussion surrounding abortion and suicide. I don't go into too much detail, but that there is a lot of that kind of at the beginning and at the end of this. Gotcha. So Kat. Yes. What do you know about Nora May French? Literally nothing. I don't think I've ever heard the name before. So then I'm going to guess you also have not heard about Carrie Sterling. That one sounds vaguely familiar, but I couldn't tell you where or why. Interesting. Okay, so our story takes place in the Gilded Age of the early 1900s. Nora May French, though, was born in 1881 to Edward French, a professor, and Mary Wells French. Mary's brother, Henry Wells, founded Wells Fargo, one of the largest financial services companies in the world, as well as American Express. Wow. So this part of the family moved from New York to California when Nora was about seven years old. Um, it wasn't an easy move, as a few years into their time in California, their farm had a massive fire and the fruit crops refused to cooperate. Ooh, bad luck. But Nora spent most of her time writing poetry and, was st and started being published in local papers and magazines in her teen years. Another journalist? No. Or more so just, like, main focus mainly on Mainly poetry. poetry, yeah. Okay, it doesn't go away from the poetry. Got no. it. Oh, gosh, no. Um, so as Nora grew up, she had a few affairs with various men. But the main one that really kind of kickstarts like the events that I'm going to be talking about um, is a man named Harry who convinced her to move to San Francisco just after the 1906 earthquake. Ooh, he was the man who could possibly help her gain more financial security from her poetry, as he was the assistant editor of The Argonaut. 
This was a paper that became extremely influential due to its strong political Americanism alongside highly regarded art and literature pieces. Many influential writers of the time had their work published in this Mm -hmm. paper. So editor of a big fancy magazine, and we got this girl who's trying to become a poet. So already there's like, so did her parents approve of this move to like this, like, you know, San Francisco right after an earthquake, it would feel like it's kind of risky. Like, was her family like, okay with this? I think so. Her sister at first wasn't okay with it, but then Nora ended up convincing her sister to move in with, like, to okay. move with her. Um, her parents were, especially her father, was very adamant about her doing well with poetry. Okay, so her father was pushing her towards it. Yeah. The, like, poetry specifically, not necessarily right. the guy. Yes, considering okay. that this was a married right, man. gotcha. Um, So he wasn't really kind to Nora, as he often apparently used harsh words with her. But his letters were always sweet and full of promises that he couldn't keep due to his marriage. Hold up. He's married? Yes. And not to her, but he's trying to fly her out to San Francisco? Correct, and he actually builds her a house for her to live in. That's next level. Like like cheating bad enough but like building a house for your mistress why yeah oh my gosh that's awful it gets even crazier later on in the story with a few of how of like how these people interact with each other oh okay this guy's already in my bad books i don't like him yeah but (laughs) as i just like as i just said um nora stayed in san francisco even though she couldn't actually marry him and convinced her sister to move in with her. Okay. Then one sure. day, Nora found herself two weeks late. Oh, no. And her cycles were never na- late, so she knew that there was a baby coming. And it's and she's the mistress. Oh, that's bad. Immediately, she went to the pharmacy and purchased a box of pills that promised to bring on quote-unquote suppressed menstruation and be a quote-unquote female cure so plan like a like oh boy i was gonna say like a plan b but if she's already pregnant then plan b is too late yeah so basically you would so these pills were advertised as uh, being always reliable and never dangerous but they were literal abortion pills that were sold because doing abortions was illegal at this point, so they were sold yeah. as a way of basically saying, like, oh, it'll help you with your suppressed menstruation and be a female cure, even though everybody oh. who was going to be using it knew what that code meant. Oh, that's sneaky. And they were pretty boxes and everything, like, to make them look all wholesome. Really feminine with, like, flowers painted on yeah, them, probably. Pretty much. And, like, <laughs> watercolor. <laughs> yeah. Could just as easily be a box of tea. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. But, okay, so I know not enough about, like, this subject from, like, the early 1900s, but wasn't it a thing that, like, abortions were, like, really dangerous at that point because no one really knew how to do it safely unless they were doing it with, like, herbs? Because they are basically Correct. just using poison. Correct. And even with these herbs, because, as I said, like, all women who took these like pills, Belladonna and they stuff. knew that it was a major risk, as two of the common ingredients were notoriously deadly. deadly. So those yeah. who took them would usually either get the result that they wanted, or a result that they dreaded. <sighs> so literally, Yikes. every time you took it, it was a risk that your body may decide, oh, I'm going to allow this poison to kill me, rather than just kill the fetus and remove... And oh, they cause a miscarriage, basically. That's scary. That's that's some high stakes stuff. Yeah, but that's what a lot of women were willing to risk at this point. Mm. So thankfully for Nora, the pills did not kill her, uh, but they did do their job, and she was no longer with child. She okay. knew that if she had carried this baby to term, she would lose her sister, who hated Harry. And lose her lover, who was keeping her in comfortable living situations. Yeah, because there's no way he would take accountability for it. He'd be like, no, it's definitely not mine. And then, like, 
complete throw throw her under the bus and stuff rather than admit that he's the one who's literally cheating on his wife. Correct. Yeah. Yikes. Uh, So while dealing with the pains of contractions during the abortion, Sarah actually wrote to Harry detailing the trauma that she was enduring. So real time, she was writing of her feelings while she was having these contractions and the pain and everything. Uh, I mean, I guess that's one way to kind of like... (sighs) Yikes. So (laughs) this is a quote from that letter. Mm Mm-hmm. Very dear, I have been through deep waters and proved myself cowardly after all. I have gone through every shade of emotion. It was as if we were walking together and my feet were struggling with some pulling quicksand under the grass. I would come near screaming very often. Honey, you're going through contractions. I feel like it's okay to, like, oh no, sweetie, baby. Well, here's the thing. So she was trying to do this as quietly as possible. Because her sister wasn't in the next room. Oh my gosh, but even so... And she didn't want her sister to know anything that was happening while this is happening in the middle of the night. Honey, oh no. That's so sad. That's really tragic. To go through something like that and then go through it alone is just like... Oof. Yeah. That's really sad. So after this abortion being Nora's second in her young life... She found herself rescued by an organization of bohemian artists at a place called Carmel by the Sea. Carmel is technically a small city in California that is known for its rich history of art and literature. After the earthquake, many artists decided to settle in this tiny town, creating like a full-on arts colony. In fact, they could actually pay $10 down with little or no interest and an agreement to make payments when they could in order to buy home lots. Why does this kind of sound like a hippie commune? It kind of is. Kind of, okay. <laughs> um, so one interesting note that I found in my research is actually that Meg Cabot, the author of the Princess Diaries series, set her yeah. mediator series in Carmel. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I kind of thought it was interesting for like a more modern take on how <laughs> this little town is doing. Gotcha. So, taking the offer, uh, Nora moved to Carmel and into the home of George and Carrie Sterling. This little bungalow was the center of the writing colony, so it was the perfect place for the poetess to make herself even more well-known nationally. Mm. Um, So, Carrie had met George when she followed her sister into being an assistant to the bookkeeper, a.k.a. George. She found herself slowly falling for him, but what clinched the deal was when George admitted to her one day that he didn't want children. Carrie had seen what having children could do to a woman of the time and had vowed to never have them herself, so George was kind of her perfect match. Aww. Uh, But let's go back to Nora for a quick moment. Um, Mm -hmm. So as I said earlier, she was kind of considered to be a prodigy in the poetry world at the time. Um, especially by her father, who had pushed her to visit Charles Loomis, who founded a literary journal when she was 17 years old. Nora had sent her poems to Loomis a few months back and got the reply that she should continue writing, but she wasn't so sure on meeting him in person when she wasn't invited to do so. Okay. The day did come for the two of them to meet, and by April of 1899, a poem of Nora's was published on the front page of the journal. Oh, nice. She never looked at the published piece, however, as Nora rarely read anything she wrote once it was finished. Uh, like, okay. Once it's finished, I could kind of, like, that kind of makes sense to me. Like, it's kind of like recording something and then listening to your voice back, like me not rewatching my uh, Twitch VODs, even though I should, and <laughs> not, like, listening back to the podcast, even though I should, because I don't like the sound of my own voice. I yeah. already. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like, it's, I, I kind of get that. Yeah, because, I mean, it reminds me a lot of myself in my writing. Like, I'll get something out and then pop it to the side. Yeah. Or... Like, every now and then, like, I have, like, poetry saved from when I dabbled in it back in the day. And, like, I, every now and then I'll kind of come across it in my files as I'm going through my computer or whatever. And kind of look at it and be like, ah, oh, yes, that's where I was at at that point in life. And then I don't touch it and it just stays in a random file on my laptop for no one else to read or see ever 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 
Yeah. So there would be, like, pieces of her poetry, like, when this journal was published with, like, the her piece on the paper, on the front, her family was reading it and celebrating, and they're trying to get her to read it, and she's like, nope, and she finished whatever poem she was doing at that time, popped it to the, like, popped it down on the counter and walked away. Yep. Kind of a thing, right? Like, that's just kind of how she lived her life in general. Mm. Um, so in Carmel by the Sea, writers and artists would meet and rub off on each other. For the Sterlings, that author is that is said to ruin their life would be none other than Jack London. Okay. So Carrie blamed him for pulling her husband to the side of debauchery and encouraging him to have mistresses. Mm. George was actually technically the mentor who was teaching Jack to be responsible and more mature with his writing. But Carrie only saw the alcohol in the women that kind of overrode any of the parties that they attended at the London home. Oh, good lord. Okay. But there's also some jealousy happening on George's side. As oh, the no. years okay. went along, Jack became a millionaire off of his quote-unquote damn dog tales, as George would see them. Why? And George's writing was seen as a slog to get through, even though he considered himself at the same level as Rudard Kipling. <laughs> okay, so so he thinks he's this great, amazing writer, and everyone else is just like, your writing is so dry and boring. Yeah. Or like, at least this other, this one other person in particular. That's, well, that's in general, dynamic. Well, like, people are like, like, he, like, he, like, George never fully did well with his writing. Like, he couldn't really live off of it. He still had to have another job. Yeah. But he's watching so, as, like, Jack London is writing about dogs, and he's going and getting, and making millions. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of how it is. Like, that's kind of how it is when you try to get published. Like, you never know what's going to hit and what's not. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. That's a dynamic and a half. So his wife threw, saw through it all, and though she might have considered divorce, it wasn't really an option at the time, so she just kind of went along with her husband's flow. Right, okay. Now, Nora had met Carrie and George when she was with Harry, the man who got her pregnant earlier in this story. Harry was known for bringing right. a new girl basically every week, but Carrie seemed to especially dislike this one. Okay, so hold up, so... <laughs> Not only is Nora his mistress, but she's also not his only. Is he? But is he? Is he building houses for all the rest of them as well? Like, what the hell is happening? Who knows? Like, it didn't go into Bruh. what he did with all these other mistresses. Uh, okay. So when Nora yeah, entered um, the Sterling house, she entered the room all bubbly, introduced herself, and took a seat like she'd been there many times before, which didn't go well. Um, on Carrie's side, who was like, y we don't know you. Like, you're just one of his other floozies. <laughs> oh, no. Um, George had gotten her a drink, and according to Carrie, she never shut up after her first drink. Same, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> the nail in Nora's coffin, however, was the fact that she did not follow Carrie into the kitchen to assist with dinner. Instead, she oh. stayed and drank and talked with all the men. <laughs> How dare she? How dare she want to have fun and hang out? Even oh man, social faux pas. Yeah, they're so hard to understand sometimes. So you might be wondering why in the heck Nora would have been invited to stay with the Sterlings, as I said that she moved in with them. Right. You see, George and Carrie were basically the couple who were tasked with bringing more big name artists and writers to the community. Right. So they spent most of their time inviting writers to their home and working on convincing them to make the move to the beautiful beachfront area. One of the best-selling points was the fact that Carmel by the Sea ba barely felt the quake that almost killed most of their friends who were still living in San Francisco. Gotcha. So it's seen as safer. Yeah. Um, on one of their sales pitch gatherings, the Sterlings organized a photo shoot that actually became the postcard for the myth of perfection that Carmel continues to try to uphold. Interesting. Okay, I love how you phrase that, myth of perfection. I'm very curious about what's going on. Yeah. 
So Nora found herself fully dragged into this whole scene by George in 1907. George was now known to be attracted to basically every woman he met, and Nora kind of knew this. Harry had even had some fears of George attempting to take his mistress from him. He's got like a dozen others I feel like he can share. Oh my gosh. It was after their breakup, however, that George made his move by kind of becoming the consoling friend. One evening, there was a perfect opportunity to make this move, like, official. So Carrie had made plans to go to the theater with her sisters, and all Mm -hmm. of George's friends were off on assignment or on holiday with their families. Gotcha. Nora met up with George at his office, where she sat and wrote a poem while waiting for him to finish up his work. Mm -hmm. It is said to be in this office, um, as she finished off her signature on the poem that was written on scrap, that they shared their first kiss. Bro. And that's, Nora um, has her first kiss with George after Harry breaks up with her, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, she breaks up with, I think she actually breaks up with Harry. She broke up with Harry. Okay. I think, yeah, like, because of the whole abortion thing and, yeah. Okay. So. This is the poem that she wrote during her wait, and it was found tucked among the 666 documents in George Sterling's archival fund. Okay. Six, hang on, sorry. 666. Yes. First of all, so many. Second of all, what a coincidence. Actually, that is very little compared to the rest of the people that they had, like friendships with and stuff who had more like 6,000 pieces in their archival funds. I thought you were going to say it was on purpose and that he intentionally only left 666 documents behind. I was going to be like, bro. No. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So this is the poem that she wrote. I pluck a jonquil when the may's a wing or please you with a rose upon the breast, a sweeter violet chosen from the rest. Your mood with blue caprice of spring leave windy vines a tendril less to swing. Why, what's a flower, a day's delight at best, a perfume loved, a faded petal pressed, a whimsy for an hour's remembering? But wondrous careful must he draw the rose from jealous earth who seeks to set anew deep root young leafage with a gardener's art. To plant it queen of all his garden close, and make his varying fancy wind and dew. Cloud, rain, and sunshine for one woman's heart. Oof. Like, literally, she wrote that probably within, like, an hour while she was just waiting for him to finish up. And her signature was written sideways in the dollars and cents column, columns of, like, the ledger paper (laughs) that she used. That's a lot, like, yeah, that's a lot of emotions. Just, yeah. Yeah. So you can kind of see how she was, like, a prodigy, right? (laughs) Well, yeah, I kind of get that. If that kind of just, like, naturally flows out of you, it's just like, okay, that's your rough draft. Yeah. Damn. Like. (laughs) Well, technically the only draft. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, okay. So she, hang on. So when you said that she uh, didn't read it back after it was done, I assumed that it was done meant after she, like, edited it. No. No? No. So just, she just wrote it and then just never looked at it again? Correct. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, that is intense. Huh. Yeah. So in August, when Nora moved into the Sterling home, she had actually rekindled a relationship with an old flame of hers while Harry was attempting to win her back. Harry needs to find a hobby. (laughs) Other than trying to seduce women constantly, because that's ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah. So George sold the idea of Nora moving in to Carrie by telling her that it would only be for a few weeks while Nora waited for her man to sail back to pick her up. Uh Carrie agreed to it, glad to possibly have Nora out of her life for a while, most likely. George picked Nora up from the train station, happy in his role as the rescuer. Which Mm -hmm. apparently he actually made her feel worse about her situation because she could have easily carried the bags that he just so gallantly swooped up in his attempt at being, like, the man to save Mm -hmm. the day. But really, it just made her feel, like, weak and useless. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So as time slowly went on, Nora actually started to grow on Carrie 
as she seemed to have become more quote-unquote womanly since her previous visits with Harry. That she would actually, like, ask to help out in the kitchen and clear away the dishes and stuff like that. That she didn't just make herself at home and hang out with the men and drink. So she starts, like, following those, like, female, like, social expectations? Uh, Yeah, like, a little bit more. Okay. So the two of them slowly became good friends, and Carrie started to understand the pain behind the lines of Nora's poetry as she kind of got to know the girl and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So Nora's man soon came for her, and she left with him. But less than a week later, she returned in tears alone. Ooh. Nora was 26 years old, and there's no record of what happened during this time frame. She didn't write about it this time? She didn't write about it, and nobody, like, has, like, there's no, like, at least living record of what happened. So nobody knows if Nora broke up with this guy, if this guy never actually engaged, like, like proposed to her like he was supposed to, or what actually happened. And to clarify, this guy we know is not Harry? This is not Harry. This is a British okay. guy who was, like, all, like, he was, like, a full-on British gentleman. So people were like, oh, this will be a good thing for her. It's not, like, a mm. Harry. <laughs> Ooh. Awkward. So, unfortunately for <laughs> Carrie... Sorry. <laughs> no worries. So unfortunately for Carrie, Nora's state was alarming. Um, and the woman was dead set on making her stay with the Sterlings permanent. <laughs> Oh, okay. That's kind of sweet. This is going to become a threesome, like a real awkward threesome situation. Well, that's real the problem. Fast, but that's for a the sweet time, intention. For this time, it would look to outsiders <sighs> like Nora was a live in mistress since she was unmarried and not like a working girl in the house. So Carrie was like, uh, Listen. no, this is not going to look good. <laughs> so, okay. So Nora wants to move in. George wants Nora to move in. But Carrie's like, uh, optics? Yeah. Okay. So, oh my gosh. In October, Nora left to visit her sister back in San Francisco and then returned late in the month along with George, who had been out that way for the weekend. When she returned, she assisted with making pasta for a goodbye dinner for one of their friends, Mary Austin. Mm. The dinner went off successfully until everyone gathered in the living room to hear a snippet from Mary's book in progress. The book was written as revenge for herself being overlooked as a writer of significance because she was a female. Mary read from a scene where the main character finds a vial of poison under her stored wedding dress, drinks from it, and dies dramatically at the feet of her husband. Ooh. Like some Romeo, like, I was going to say Romeo and Juliet, but where it's like a Roman, it's kind of sort of framed as a romance, but it's really just tragic and heartbreaking. Yeah. When the reading was finished, everybody was kind of quiet, um, including mm-hmm. Carrie, who was trying to figure out, like, a polite w- way to bring in conversation. Yeah. Until Nora spoke up, asking if death by cyanide really looked like how Mary described it. Oh, no, she romanticized it. Yeah. Oh, no. By I'm mid-November, sorry. Nora was pronounced dead by cyanide ingestion. Oh, baby girl, no. Her and Carrie were the only ones home since George had left for a week for work. It said that Carrie held her close as she passed away around midnight. There was a short inquiry after Nora's death where Carrie says that she entered Nora's room and found her friend foaming at the mouth with convulsions. She'd grabbed her a drink of water and proceeded to watch her friend go pale and convulse, but then got into the bed and tried to warm her for about an hour. Carrie claimed that she didn't realize that Nora was dead when she was attempting to warm her, but admitted that she had probably died within a minute of her arrival. When she realized that Nora was dead, she then ran to the nearby homes of their writer friends for help. Oof. Carrie then later revealed that Nora had attempted suicide two days prior by taking George's revolver into the woods to shoot herself. Somehow, she had only managed to shoot off one golden curl of her hair only. Must have pulled away at the last second. Well... So no one's really sure about how like, the, how this story of 
like about this story in general as a gunshot right. that close to her head would have caused a lot more evidence than just one curl being removed. Well, okay, that's fair. So there would have been gunpowder you... residue and most um, likely some noticeable hearing loss in that ear. Yeah, totally. And you said it was a revolver, not a shotgun, right? A revolver, yeah. Revolver, okay. So a pistol handheld totally could be used on yourself, but like, yeah, still... Still does significant damage even if you miss. Yeah. So there was also no correspondence or journal entries that talked about the attempted suicide. The only Mm -hmm. evidence for the incident is the one statement made by Carrie. No notes were left for either suicide attempt. Are we suspecting Carrie poisoned her with the cyanide and that it wasn't? And she's trying to frame it as a suicide it's, by, like, making up this other story about it? There's a, like kind a, of, like, a, con- like a whole conspiracy about it, kind of, with, like, oh, a whole no. society um, mm-hmm. that I'm kind of going to kind of go into here. Gotcha. Um, okay. So Nora wasn't actually the only higher-profile suicide happening at this time. Um, the right. same week also saw a prominent banker commit suicide while his wife entertained a guest just downstairs. Oh, well, um, she's got company over. Yeah. So, Something about that just feels like even like, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Something about that feels even worse. Yeah. I'm like, dude, like you could have waited. <laughs> it's well, a little bit. Yeah. Like not to be heartless, but like, it does feel like a little bit like, I don't know, just like, like almost inconsiderate yeah. of like the people that you're leaving behind. I don't know. Um, so bankers at this time were kind of public enemy number one um, due to a tanking economy. Mm-hmm. So his death kind of outshone Nora's in the papers. But that wasn't mm. the end of it all. The papers continued to talk about Nora's death, wondering why did she ta- why she had taken her life when it looked like she had all she could want. And various papers across the different states all had very different ideas about the reasoning behind her poisoning. And none of them had any kind of psychological basis, I'm going to assume, because this is the early, early 1900s. So one paper, like, I think it was Chicago, like, people mm-hmm. in Chicago all believed that she was just done with life. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's kind of their idea of, like, the psychological was just that, well, the beauty of life has diminished, had diminished for her, and so she took her own life. Okay. So, like, she was depressed and, yes. like... And she actually okay. had a history of depression in which one of her uncles kind of told her a bit about how to kill herself. Bro, you can't be doing that. That's... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, dear. So, there is speculation about the nature of her death in general, as archival documents of George and Carrie's share a confusing narrative. Okay. So the husband and wife made very similar statements about Nora's death and seemed to have been writing in the same journal where Carrie would take over talking about the events that happened around the house when George was out of town. Okay. One interesting note is that in George's entries, he would put Nora's name all in capitals, something he only did for things he truly loved, including his own name. Wait, okay, wait. So he has this intentional, theoretically, writing thing where he just, if he likes it, he just writes it in all capitals? Yes. So like he's done this with, so he'll do this with, like, he'd have done this with some of his other mistresses' names. Bro. He does it with his <sighs> own name. Um, that's, for some reason, that's... Carrie would call him father, and then he would go into the journal and scratch it out and put his own name in all capitals. My dude, that's the the lack of subtlety, like just the sheer audacity of like naming your mit- mistresses and essentially highlighting them. Yeah. When your wife writes in the same journal. Yeah. I, okay, cool. Um. So then there's <sighs> also an interesting line from an intimate letter between Carrie and her friend Blanche on the night after Nora's death. It okay. reads... She played the game. She died looking so beautiful. Ah, uh, that's not good. That's not good. That's that's 
Especially since she asked, like, if dying by cyanide is actually how her friend wrote it in the book, which I'm presuming was, like, in a romantic, tragic sort of way. Yeah. Like, frothing at the mouth is not beautiful, so I can only imagine that that's a reference to her asking if, like, it really was as beautiful as it sounded. So, apparently, whenever Carrie used the phrase, the game, she always Mm. meant the game of doing what you could to advance in the world. Sure. The number one question is, when did Carrie find out that Nora was pregnant and that her husband had poured the ashes of two people into the ocean during her funeral? She was pregnant with George's kid? Yes, apparently so. A girl never a girl never learns. I I mm, honey, you can't be doing that when you live in the house with his wife. You'd think uh, It's literally it's giving Anne Boleyn, but like <laughs> worth Like oh my gosh. So, after Nora's death, there was a spike in suicides where no notes were left. And a poem of Nora's was seen to be the spark of this possible suicide pact that was sweeping across the country after being reprinted in various newspapers. And even with one of these people who committed suicide, this poem mm -hmm. was found folded up in their pocket and they were in New York. No, so she had a Okay, so so she had a poem, and it's was it like okay was was the poem intentionally written as like a suicide note or was it just kind of the last poem that she wrote? What I'll do is I'll read you part. Is I'll read you like this poem, and then okay. I'll give you a little bit more information. Okay. So this is how it was written in the papers. I tilt my hallowed life and look within. The wine it held has left a purple trace. Behold, a stain where happiness had been. If I could shatter down this empty vase, through what abyss would my soul be tossed to meet its judge in undiscovered lands? What sentence met me alone and lost before him with the fragments in my hands? Better the patient earth that loves me still should drip her clearness on this purple stain. Better my life upheld to her should fill with limped d- dew and gra- and gradual gift of rain. And it was printed with the title Suicide. Oof. That shit got published? It got published. After she died? Now here's the thing. I suicide? This That's poem just cold. was never actually written as a suicide poem. It was actually a chunk taken from one of her other poems called The Spanish Girl, and the papers actually misprinted various words even, most notably that she had a hollowed life rather than a hollowed life like she intended in the poem. So like an A instead of an O? Yes. Like hollowed or hollowed, okay. Correct. Oh, Oh my gosh. Bro, I... Ah, uh, that's, that's, that's poor taste. Like that, like I, mm. okay, so she didn't have a note. She didn't have a note. And that poem but was poem taken was just like... out of context and based as a very, like, other people had perhaps okay. read her poetry because it was, she was kind of everywhere. And so yeah. that chunk was just found with somebody. And so then they decided that that was... <laughs> So, hold up. So, that's, like, that's, like, uh, taking, oh, my gosh, I can't even, (laughs) like, okay. So, that's kind of the equivalent of taking, like, I'm trying to think of, like, a modern fiction author who might do this. Okay. So, that's, like, if Stephen King, right, write some dark stuff. That's, like, if Stephen King died under mysterious, uh, presumably suicidal uh, circumstances, and someone took a quote from... Carrie lamenting how awful her life is and then use that as his suicide note like that's like you oh, okay <laughs> uh, I'll do that yeah oh oh no oh that makes you so uncomfortable now other people were also dying in Carmel by the sea uh-huh um 
where there was some stuff where the people were making it seem like it was because of Nora, like that Nora was the influence. So, yeah, so like copycats. Correct. Oh, come on. And this is like included like a school teacher and stuff. And when the author of like one of the books that I used was like doing her research, mm-hmm. one um one of like the people at the archives in Carmel by the Sea Apparently, I stopped and looked outside and said, this place kills women. Oof. So there's a history of women in Karma by the Sea kind of having bad lives and then being found dead, either by suicide or mysterious like, circumstances. So awful. Yeah. Like, and especially since it's meant to be this, like, artistic haven. Where all these people can come together and, like, create, like... Beauty. Yeah. And art. Like, beauty. Yeah. Like, works of art together. Like, that's so sad. Yeah. So, after Nora's death, the Sterlings found themselves in a precarious life position. Mm -hmm. They relied on the Carmel Development Company's good graces for various months when George wasn't getting paid at work, so they needed to continue bringing in famous residents. Mm. But George's behavior was getting in the way of it anytime he was left alone with the people they were trying to convince. Okay. So the family's financial and social situations continued in a downward spiral as the years went on, mainly due to George's drinking and wandering hands. George, come on, get it together. He had affair after affair, and it started to affect every part of Carrie's life, especially after one of his affairs left town pregnant with his child. Okay, girl, time to leave him. Like, She finally filed for divorce in December of 1913. Mm. George did not fight it one bit, and signed over the Carmel bungalow to her, which she immediately then sold to their friends with the desire to never set foot there again. Honestly, fair. There's a lot of trauma that happened there. I wouldn't want to live there anymore either. Here's the thing, though. Oh, no. (laughs) Carrie was, of course, punished by society for the divorce. Oh, God, how dare a woman have standards for her own life? It's a sad truth for this time for women, um, and Carrie just wasn't spared the anguish of it. She ended up going into deep poverty and found herself missing out on payments from George. She was owed around $5,000 by the summer of 1918, and she never saw a penny of it, even though she had hired a lawyer to scare him into making the payments. He went from being a cheating womanizer to being, like, completely useless, and that is... Oof. When... She finally had enough by August. She wrote a note of how to disperse her belongings, another note to share how beauty had been taken out of life, stirred Mm. cyanide into a glass of water, and drank it. I, okay, so after watching how Nora died, I wonder if she meant it then when she said that Nora died beautifully. Like, I can't think of any way that you know, the physical effects of cyanide. Like, I can't think of any way about how that might be beautiful, but, like, I wonder if some part of her actually did believe it. Possibly. If she chose the same method. So, at Carrie's funeral, her mother made a brief appearance to stand at the head of her daughter and pronounce, Carrie, you've done a terrible thing and you're no daughter of mine, before walking out. Ah. Oh, ow, dude. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Is empathy a recent invention? Like, I can't, like, uh, wrap my head around all of the, like, just selfishness in this story. Like, you have Harry who's cheating. You have George who's cheating. You have Carrie who doesn't give a rat's ass about this other woman because she's seen as a threat. And, like, No matter what, how, like, awful her own situation is, you have Nora who's going around and, like, just, uh, like, not respecting the fact that other men are married. And, like, ah, what the heck, guys? Like, get... Yeah. I know Carrie's mom. Like, what an awful thing to say about your daughter who is clearly struggling. 
Well, to make matters even worse for Carrie's memory... No. <laughs> papers uh -huh. printed previously written poems of George's, including one that was written for Nora May French, not his ex-wife. Oh my gosh. That's just cold. Like, what the actual heck? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Nora, you said Nora was a writer too, right? Or yes. Or was Nora not? Nora or, sorry, was not the... Nora. I mean, um, Carrie. Carrie, no, she wasn't the writer. She just was part of that group because of gotcha. her marriage. Okay, because yeah. I was going to say, like, they couldn't use anything of, like, Carrie's own work. Like, they had to use George's as well, but... That well, and that's how she Carrie was, like, famous enough to be put in the papers as well, right? Is that she yeah. was married to George and because of their connection with Nora, who died in their home, basically. So, okay, so that's, like, I'm trying to connect it back to, like, a modern pop couple again. <laughs> so that's, like, okay, so who's who's married to the next? Okay, so Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, right? Okay, so that's, like, if Angelina Jolie died after they had, like, a divorce and, like, a messy divorce and he was, like, oh, I may or may not have been, like, with Jennifer... Aniston or whatever like while well, Angelina was still married to him so that's like if Angelina Jolie died and then they printed about Brad Pitt in her obituary yeah ew <laughs> what? what yeah oh my gosh so those who were close with Carrie at the time of her death completely blamed Nora for <laughs> how Carrie decided to kill herself with one of these friends saying that the cyanide was the remainder of what Nora didn't take years prior. You cannot. Come on. Like, it's, like, I'm sure that stuff has a shelf life. Like, I like that seems far-fetched. Like, it's not like Nora, you know, hurt herself thinking, like, oh, I hope other people copy me. Like, no one who commits suicide is wanting other people to feel the same way as them. Like, that's... No. Like, come on. That's unfair. Okay. As Carrie oh was gosh. struggling and committing suicide, George was back in New York trying to wrangle up the money that he owed his ex-wife, completely afraid of say, being sued by her. I thought, you're, I thought you were going to say he was trying to wrangle up more mistresses, and I was, like, not even surprised. Well, well when also news that... of her death reached him, it is said that he was absolutely destroyed. Yet he continued to write to his current lover and made the plans to return to San Francisco now that the threat of a lawsuit was relieved from over his head. What the actual, like, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah. That's so tone deaf, like, I can't. Like, he's destroyed by the fact that his ex-wife killed herself, but he's like, oh, cool, and now but I can also, go back to San Francisco. It's him and his personal matters. <laughs> I, like... My dude, I, I, ah, uh, I give up, man, I give up. <laughs> By November oh of 1926, George mm -hmm. had gone completely downhill. His drinking had reached an, ex an extreme and he felt, had felt like he was a complete fool. He was supposed to have been the one to build Carmel, but he had really only brought one poet there and he felt like it was him who had killed her. Oops. He's not... Like, I mean, she didn't leave a note, so it's impossible to know. Yeah. All the great but American like, writers were now leaving America sure. and going abroad to find their inspiration. So, like, F. Scott mm -hmm. Fitzgerald, Hemingway, etc. Leaving him yeah. behind in the dust. Oh, no. I see where this is going, and that's just, like... Okay. On the back of a din dinner menu on November 12th, George wrote a poem as a note to his friend. The back of a dinner menu. Yes, like in a hotel. Like he was in the hotel, uh, like, like the hotel restaurant, like downstairs. And yeah. Yeah. So it's called My Swan Song. No. <laughs> okay. Has man the right to die and disappear when he has lost the fight? To sever without fear the irksome bonds of life when he is tired of strife? May he not seek, if it seems best, relief from grief? May he not rest from labor's vain, from hopeless task. I do not know, I merely ask. All of these people need, like, literally just need to go to therapy. 
and I know that wasn't a thing back then, but like, oh my gosh, guys. Four to five days later, uh -huh. George was found in his hotel room in an impossible position with the bed sheet stuffed in his mouth. There were burnt papers in a pile of ash next to neatly placed stacks of manuscripts and a small glass vial laid in the corner of the room. Oh, Not shit. too far from the pile well. of ashes was the poem that Nora wrote in George's office many years ago. George was dead from cyanide poisoning, passing away around the midnight the previous evening to his body being found. He had carried the bottle of cyanide with him for years, apparently. Okay, so that one confirmed is the same sentence as Nora's. Oh my gosh. So that one confirmed is the same bottle as Nora's then? No. It's not confirmed no? to be the same bottle as Nora's. It's just that he had carried a bottle of cyanide with him for years. Oh, okay. Not necessarily the same bottle. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is some... Like, I... Hmm, that's some dark shit. So the stuff that he burned, is that, that's got to be like love letters to other mistresses or something incriminating or something. He apparently, so that's why there's oh, apparently there's only the 666 is because he, he had burned a pile of stuff. Yeah. Um, Maybe unpublished stuff he wasn't proud of or something. I don't know. Well, and also there's, they, they, people consider that there's, because there's some letters missing mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah, okay, so something incriminating, probably. Most likely, yes. Like, oof. That is, that is some dark shit. Yeah. Yikes. Cyanide was way too easy for people to get their hands on. Oh my god, yeah. Back in the day, like, seriously, like, it was, it's like, it was genuinely used in, like, a bunch of stuff, and it was, like, a, a household, like, thing to have, practically, at that point, but, like, Oh my gosh, there should there absolutely should have been more regulations about around that already. Like it's literally well, just poison. It was basically like the new arsenic. Well, yeah, but like why was that available either? Like people can't be trusted with this shit, clearly. Like, like Yeah. Uh that is why they are now controlled substances, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so depending on where you are. Yeah, that's kind of the story of those three. Holy shit, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, and, like, other people who were in, like, most of, like, their friends and stuff all had tragedy in their lives. Um, even Harry, I mm -hmm. think it was one of his wives that went a little crazy and ended up shooting and killing a kid of theirs. Ooh. Um, and then he died where he stuck his head out the car window and was be and w was beheaded basically by another car. Dude, what? Did like on purpose or like was that one just him? He was goofing off and then um, had an accident. Hang on, because that is a messed up way to go. Um, it doesn't say. It was just driving with his son through the fog. In 1935, mm -hmm. he leaned his head out the side window and was decapitated by an oncoming vehicle. His son was in the car? I think his son was driving, yeah. His Okay, his son was driving, so maybe he was, like, sticking his head out the window to, like, try to see better or something. That's... Oh, my gosh, that's so awful. Yeah. He does have a leg Especially issue, though. Um, and there's a creek named after him that flows through a canyon named after him. Oh my gosh, okay. So Even man, though he was still a had money at the end of it. I just can't, Im I feel bad for the son. Like, I can't imagine driving the car and then, like, accidentally decapitating your father. Like, that's so, like, I just, I can't imagine the survivor's, like, grief or guilt that you would have from that. Um, Clint Eastwood uh, was elected mayor of Carmel in 1986. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that kind of just seems fitting at this point. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> right. One good thing that came out of George, though, the woman who um, had left town because um, she was pregnant, she yeah. spent the early 1940s interviewing women who had resorted to illegal abortion mills um, mm -hmm. and putting out a report um, that called for freely accessible birth control and generous maternity leave. Hmm. So at least something good came out of them. 
Yeah, so she went on to be an activist. That's cool. But there is a bench in San Francisco that it, where the park around it has now been named George Sterling Park. Okay. So, okay. So Harry had things named after him. George had things named after him. Nora and Carrie did not get anything named after them. As far as we know, correct. Yeah, because like another guy that was friends with them um, in 1927 stabbed his private secretary and then and lover to death and then ended his own life by throwing himself out the window. Bro, what the heck? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, nobody I, uh, was safe around these people. Was everyone just, everyone was high all the time. Right? Like, that's... I guess so. That's the only, like... That's... Right? Like... I can't... Like, either that or there's, like, something in the air or something in the water or something. All of these people have, like... Like, I like I know about, like, the... The, um, the suffering artist trope, but, like, holy shit. That's a little, like, too on the nose, kind of, isn't it? Like... Oh, man. Like, yeah. I feel like this entire story, I'm just like, come on, people. Get your shit together. <laughs> Yeah, you'd think. Right? But yeah. That is the insanity, apparently, of the artist colony in Carmel by the Sea in the nineteen in like the earlier nineteen hundreds. Like I had no idea where this was gonna go when you started the story. I did not expect it to go here. We've got like at least three suicides, probably, mostly confirmed. Yeah, we've that got... are considered to be suicides, but may or may not have been suicides. Theories. Like, it sounds... This is such a dumb, cheesy connection. But, like, it literally makes me think of, like, um... This is so cheesy. This is such a dumb connection. But it makes me think of, like, in Supernatural, where, like, Crowley would make... No, I know. Hang on. Hear me out. Uh, where, like... Crowley would make a deal with an artist and then like come and take their soul in some tragic way. It sounds like this is a group of friends that all made a deal with the devil and then like because none of them had a peaceful death. All of them had like a horrific, like violent death. Like it just it and like all of them are like these artsy, like creative people. Like it just Yeah. It just it just it it the same vibes. Okay? Like just same vibes. Like, no, I agree, like I don't think that's anywhere near what actually happened. I think it's just a group of friends that all had mental health issues in a society that didn't know what was going on or how to address them and then all ended up dying tragically as a result. But also, like, yeah, it's that's that's a lot. That's a lot for one group. That is a lot. And especially for just, like, the one little, like, love triangle group that all yeah. freaking die of cyanide poisoning. Right? Like, it's... It's almost like the thought process was like Carrie was like, oh, it worked for Nora, so it'll work for me. And then George is like, oh, well, it worked for Nora and Carrie, so it'll work for me. And it's just like the default option for some reason. It's Well, I mean, in a way, I also wonder if Carrie had assisted with Nora's mm -hmm. because she was apparently known to be a little bit hot headed about George and his affairs but be like, oh, I can't leave him. Fair. Right? Which I make fair, but I'm like, I'm almost wondering if Nora say asking no. that question at the reading, when then she's like, oh, hang on, George is going away. I'll be the only one here. I am the only, I'll be the only one, and I'm a, I'll be considered like a credible witness. Let me help I'll this woman like out. Because I'm like, she mm -hmm. watched the woman literally convulsed with foam coming out of her mouth and then lay there with her eyes half open and then decided to get in bed to warm her for an hour? Something's off about that. I mean, it's not like... It's not like most people know what to do. No, but you'd think that you would... Like, like, you'd think you'd try to make them throw up or something. Like, like you'd think that you would... Like, if her eyes are half open, you'd think that you go... Yeah. And then she's getting cold and going paler. You wouldn't go, oh, she's getting better. Let me just cuddle her for warmth. You go, I'm going to go get somebody to get this person medical assistance. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. So I'm almost wondering if then she also had that guilt. I Then well, she did no. herself off with that guilt where she's like, okay, I'm getting, mm -hmm. like, I'm now in like the worst situation possible. 
I have a vial that's from the friggin' poisoning that happened, apparently. I kind of wonder if it's, like, something like maybe, like, Nora started it, and then Carrie just kind of came in on it and then just, like, watched it happen. Not so much that she, like, initiated it or anything, but that, like... That she just enabled it she, to continue, or she's like, oh, great, my problem solved. <laughs> didn't try to stop it. It's not my fault. She did this to herself. Yeah. I'm just going to let it happen. Like, I'm just not conveniently, like, just washing my hands of it, just not going to save her. You know, it's like, um, yeah, like, I don't, I don't have to kill you. I'm just not going to save you kind of thing, almost. Yeah. But then, yeah, so I think she had some guilt, and then that probably Mm -hmm. did a number on her mentally to then contribute to her suicide. And then I think huh. George going, okay, now there's two women that are involved with me. Yeah. My ex-wife and my ex mistress or well, ongoing mistress when, when she passed away. Yeah. Like now I am basically res- like partially responsible possibly for two women's death. Now I'm going well- to, Get yeah, worse with I my mean, drinking problem, and then that's going to contribute to my death. <laughs> and to be fair, like, even without the guilt of, like, I contributed to it, having someone that you care about, because, like, in his own way, from his perspective, he cared about both of these women, theoretically. Um, but to have someone that you care about take their own life, that will mess you up no matter how you're connected. Yeah. Whether you're there, whether you're not, whether you have any blame to carry, whether you don't, that is going to mess you up. Oh, for Probably sure. for the rest of your life. Yeah. So even if he didn't feel guilty about any kind of causation towards the situation, like there's no doubt that it definitely made him like a more darker, like, like it broke him essentially, yeah. right? Like, there's there's no way that it didn't at least add to it. No, I agree. Mhm. But yeah. Oof. That's Yeah, that one's a heavy one. That's a heavy one. For sure. Who knew the poetry scene had so much drama? Like Uh <laughs> like <laughs> that's the whole point of poetry. <laughs> yeah, but like Usually, like, I think of poetry and I think of, um, yeah, like, Thoreau or something where it's just, like, I like being by myself in the woods and, like, you know, like, See, or it's, like, I usually Shakespeare think of poetry. and it's, like, romantic sonnets. Like, I don't think of, like... I think of more of, like, the despair and, like, the pain and everything. Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. And, like, even mm. um, Amber Tamblin's poetry... She's got mm. a bit of, like, a darker side to it. Like, one of her books is literally all poetry about um, famous, like, female celebrities who died too soon. And, like, mm. kind of tr- her trying to go into their minds. And, like, all of them were, like, child actors and stuff like that. Um, right. She even had a page where she did it with her, like, one of the child actors who was having issues and hadn't died yet and had it blank basically being like she could be one of these people oof that's that's a very specific niche thing to write about well i mean she went through it so she was kind of right where she even said like she was kind of going through it as well going this is how my thinking has been um as i've been growing up and having issues Mm. this is so this is kind of like how i think think that maybe they might have thought when they had their issues bringing in your personal experience to it i can see that yeah that's fair that's fair but yeah like i mainly have seen i think mainly that i've just seen a lot of poetry that's a bit more about like getting in through the pain and stuff to and getting it out on paper in some way or shape or form so it's not eating inside of you kind of a thing yeah I mean, I remember in high school, uh, like reading poetry for class and stuff and coming across uh, Maya Angelou and like some of it was kind of about sort of the hurt and like the acknowledgement of like things not being good, but it was looking at it from almost like an optimistic light and talking about 
about like the beauty of freedom even from the inside of the cage and like yeah um you know like i know why the cage burns sings yeah and uh that poem really stuck with me for a long time just because it's like it talks about the dark and it talks about the grief and it talks about like knowing what you're missing out on but it talks about it from the sense of hope that like that thing you're not going to be locked away from it forever yeah. um and that like that really stuck with me so i think that's kind of mostly what like sort of the tone that i think about when i think mm, of poetry yeah no see i've just seen, i've seen more of like the deep dark let me show you my pain <laughs> yeah like i've seen like that's some fair. of like, the maya angelou and like some of like the newer stuff um like that one young lady from the inauguration um kind of a thing like i've seen some of those ones for sure where i'm like okay yeah like these are a bit more but like the majority of the ones i've seen especially from like this time frame have mm. definitely been more of that oh woe is me <laughs> what was the, the world gloom. yeah and like i get that the world had just like it's like the world was going through some shit at the time like i, I get it but <laughs> yeah 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 mm. But next week, I do promise that it's a little bit less... <laughs> less dark? Yeah. I think... So, yeah, the topic for next week, just kind of give you like a bit of a hint. Um, it's... it's a, it is more, like, of, like, somebody who's going out to have adventures. It's not mm -hmm. like, hey, we're going to get into this love triangle and I'll commit and suicide. All of us are gonna like, <laughs> kind yeah. of a thing. Is more okay. of like an adventure story. I like adventure stories. So let's talk about an adventure story. Okay. <laughs> I can do that. Sounds good. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll see you guys all next the time then for an adventure rather than a tragedy. I hope. Come back. I promise. I promise it'll be better. I promise that at least in, like, in some of these 30 stories, there's more of like fun things than just I love these 30s stories i promise there's fun okay <laughs> we'll have fun we will <laughs> All right. and if you need a break pop over to our movie podcast <laughs> yes you can come meet us at the drive-in on fridays yeah. <laughs> and did you just say fridays or saturdays you said fridays right fridays i figured fridays so that's okay. kind of like your usual movie night right love that love that i just for a split second i thought like because it came through like because of the way it came through it sounded like you said saturdays for a second i was like you said fridays before wait no no on fridays yeah. no friday <laughs> evening makes sense because then it's like your friday morning as you're driving into work you can get some ideas on what to watch that night you're getting ready for the weekend exactly and we are going to have some family friendly movies at least <laughs> some <laughs> some yeah some of the some of them will be family friendly. Some of them will be um, interesting. <laughs> Rewatching I mean, Grease really made like open my eyes to a lot of the stuff that I let slide when I was younger. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, but yeah, we'll talk about that on that podcast. Yeah, that's a later thing. That's a later. <laughs> that's a later episode. So yeah, until then. <laughs>